In the previous videos, we'd removed the cylinder barrel and fixed a non-sealing exhaust valve, sorted the points and made a silencer. We even managed to get the engine running, briefly, before the dodgy coil sparked its last spark and left us needing a coil rewind. I'll put links to those videos down in the description. I could have just hacked the old windings off quickly, but I needed to know roughly how many turns were on the original secondary winding. Also, I figured the primary winding was fine, so I wanted to leave that intact. But more importantly, I wanted to identify exactly where the coil had failed, so the painstaking process of unwinding it began. Straight away I measured the wire at 0.08mm in diameter, and ordered a roll ready for the rewind. There's something in the region of 308 turns per layer, and each layer is taped before the next layer is wound. The original tape appears to be thin paper daubed with shellac, which is probably the best product to use, but I'm planning on using self-adhesive transformer tape for my rewind. You can't simply wind up to the ends of the bobbin because the sides aren't even or straight, and the thin wire would snag. Additionally, the original winding has a few millimetres gap on each side, so I'll copy that as closely as I can. Just to make things more complicated when I rewind the coil, I can't simply feed the wire straight onto the bobbin, because these outriggers on the iron core will snag the wire, so I'll have to come up with some kind of curved guide to get the wire into the correct place. The wire on the outer six layers was constantly breaking as I unwound it, and after a while I realised that there were little patches of green at the point where the wire broke each time. This is more than likely due to the insulation on the wire breaking down and damp causing it to corrode. At each green point, the wire would at very best be high resistance. You can see one such breaking point here, and if I zoom into a still image, you can clearly see where the wire has broken at the green mark. The other green marks are just flakes that fell off when the wire broke. You can see the layers of paper soaked in shellac over towards the right hand side of the shot. Even when I got some better layers of the coil, the wire was still incredibly brittle compared to the new wire, and it was a frustratingly time consuming process to get it all unwound. I kept measuring the coil during the unravelling process, and it remained open circuit, so I'm expecting more corrosion as I get towards the centre. When I finally got 24 layers in, there was loads of corrosion, and that layer was wound round some thicker cloth rather than the thin paper, so I figured that this was the final layer before I got to the primary coil. You can see the fabric of the cloth over to the right, and the impression left in the shellac from where the wire had been. Looking lower and towards the middle, you can see loads of points of corrosion in the form of little green blobs. I had to cut the wire off this layer because it was just breaking every few turns when I tried to unwind it. To my surprise, underneath that layer of fabric was more layers of paper and wire. Again, just look at the corrosion. I'm amazed this coil managed to create any sort of spark at all in this state. Anyway, I finally got to the end, the innermost layer of the secondary winding being just a half layer before the thin wire is connected to a thicker wire as seen in this picture. That thicker wire then spirals outwards and is tethered to the end of the primary winding, one end of which is permanently grounded, so that gives the secondary its ground connection. There was then some more of the thick fabric to remove before I finally got my first look at the primary winding. You can see here where the thicker intermediate wire was tethered before it spiralled into the middle of the bobbin and connected to the secondary winding. During the unwinding process, the end of the primary that goes to the points has become weak where it exits the bobbin, so I'll solder a new length in place before I rewind the rest of the coil. It was a bit on the short side as it was, so a bit of extra length won't go amiss. And after all that, I've got quite a big bag of fine copper wire wool. Next task, to create some sort of coil winding machine. I know some of you might be expecting some sort of magnificent and well-engineered machine. Well, prepare to be underwhelmed, as I introduce to you the Windertron 2.0, in all of its thrown together goodness. And yes, there was a Windertron 1. That machine was used to rewind some coils for trafficators on a Ford Model A. 
Anyway, back to the Windertron 2. There's a lever up here that allows me to move the wire feed in a relatively controlled fashion. The wire itself feeds through this bent ballpoint pen with the ball removed, which should hopefully guide the wire onto the bobbin fairly neatly. I've already wrapped the thicker intermediate wire up to the middle of the bobbin by hand, leaving a bit free to attach the fine wire to when I'm ready to start winding. The reel of wire is mounted in line with the wire feed tube, or as close as is possible, bearing in mind the feed tube will move, as will the point at which the wire will come off the reel. And the spindle of the reel is an old drumstick, naturally. I've got a counter recovered off an old printing press, so I can check how many turns I'm applying. I'm aiming for 26.5 layers, with around 308 turns per layer. In other words, just over 8,000 turns. Although I bet you could be a fair way off that amount in either direction and the thing would still work just fine. The drive unit is an old electric screwdriver with the dead batteries removed and the power now coming from my bench power supply, with a foot switch so I can have both hands free to control the wire feed. I had a couple of false starts doing the winding. The initial half layer went ok, but when I went in the other direction to do the first full layer, the wire broke. So I unwound it and started again. After the second failure, I figured that there was too much drag on the sides of the wire reel, so I quickly hacked away the wood from the roll holder so it only contacted in the centre, and that did the trick. We'll now rejoin the action a few layers in. There's quite a bit to learn if and when I do another rewind like this. Firstly, making sure the coil was running perfectly true would definitely assist in getting a neatly laid down wind. Secondly, using tape of the correct width to cover the entire bobbin might help to keep it flat. Doing it the way I was with narrower tape created a bulge where they overlapped in the middle. I improved this later on by using an additional layer of narrow tape at the edge before wrapping the entire bobbin, but definitely my taping could have been better. And lastly, I'd add some sort of screw drive to my wire advancing lever, like using a lathe. This would make it easier to control the wire feed more accurately. Another casualty, my counter stopped working a few layers in, but by that stage I was happy that I could judge the amount of turns accurately enough by the length of each layer, so I just disconnected it completely. The winding process took about three and a half minutes per layer, plus the time for taping each layer. I did have an overnight stop halfway through because it was all getting a bit mind numbing and it was getting late, and I'd have probably just made a mistake if I'd have carried on. So, with the coil wound and the terminator connected and taped securely in place, it was time to measure the resistance. The primary remained unchanged at around 1 ohm, and then switched to the 20k range and measured the secondary, if I can keep my fingers out of the way. About 2.4k. That's much more like it. Time to try it on the engine. I really should have cleaned the rest of this backplate while the coil was off, but I was eager to see the engine running, so that can wait. The keen-eyed among you may have spotted what could be described as a minor cock-up. In my mind, the terminator was dead centre on the coil, but it must have been round to the side because the plug lead doesn't reach anymore. I can easily bridge the gap. It just depends on the proximity of the flywheel. If it's very close to the terminator, the spark might just leap there instead of going to the spark plug, but I'll hook it up and see how it goes. So, do we have a spark? Yes we do, and that's one heck of a spark. Good times. Now to reassemble and try the engine again. Right, that's everything set up and ready to go. I hadn't tried the engine at this point, but I was pretty hopeful. I wouldn't expect it to start first pull because it has to suck fuel up the pipe from the tank. But here goes. Pull 1. It didn't start, but I think it might have fired towards the end of the pull. So rewind the rope and try again. Thank you. 
second pull, not bad. There was a little bit of mixture juggling to do to get it running smoothly. The mixture screw has clearly been screwed in too hard in the past and it's a bit distorted, so finding that sweet spot might be a tad trickier than normal. You might not be able to tell in the video, but it's quite loud. If I'm planning to display this engine at a few shows, I'll need to make a secondary silencer or my neighbouring exhibitors won't like me very much. Next, it's time to see if the generator part is working. This battery is a bit neglected and it's showing 11.9 volts disconnected. So I'll hook it up and see what we get. With the rear stat turned down, it's reading around 13.5 volts. And if I turn the rear stat up, you can hear the engine load up and we get just over 16 volts. So that's all good. It's a bit of a brute force charging set you wouldn't want to leave it running all day without some load on the battery or you'd end up cooking the battery or batteries. And what about the luxury feature? Will the electric start work? And that would be yes. I'm not sure how much good the ammeter is. I guess it gives a vague idea of the current but I'll probably use an external ammeter to keep an eye on the charge level. So now I think it's time for me to set up some better audio equipment and stop talking for a while so you can enjoy the engine in its full glory. I've still got a few more props to gather together to make an interesting display, but the generator is more or less ready to take out an exhibit now. That's about it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.